Welcome everyone uh, to tonight's presentation. Uh, we are going to be hearing about moose from Vermont Fish and Wildlife Biologist, Nick Fortin. I'll turn it over to Nick in just a moment, just some housekeeping things that we need to cover. Uh, please keep your mics muted so that we have no background noise from your homes. And uh, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box and I'll relay those to Nick at the end. And we'll have uh, questions until eight uh, after he finishes his presentation. We'll wrap it up, eight, I'm sorry, 7.30. <laughs> I won't keep you on that long, Nick, I promise. Um, and uh, we will um, have those questions. And if there's anything left unsaid, we can get those handled at another time. Uh, we're really excited to have Nick uh, presenting on moose tonight. Uh, we have a lot of issues, uh, both uh, good and bad with moose. And I'm looking forward to hearing all the updates on where our moose population stands here in Vermont. And again, type your questions in the chat box. And thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Nick, why don't you take it away? You're muted. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> Had to do that. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lisa, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, I'll get right started here. Um, we'll jump right in. Uh, hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so I'm going to cover kind of the, um, the history of moose in Vermont, uh, the current status and some of the threats uh, to moose in Vermont and, and kind of touch on a few life history traits as, as we go along here. But um, so to get started, kind of a broad overview, um, moose are a northern forest species. So um, this is actually a map of the, the boreal forest or, or taiga, as it's often called, um, across the globe. And this is a map of moose range across the globe. Um, you can see this, they pretty much perfectly overlap each other. Um, moose are very closely tied to boreal forests. Uh, in North America, uh, moose actually came to North America from Eurasia, where they first evolved, um, sometime prior to, at least as far as anyone knows, prior to the last ice age, um, through Alaska from Siberia, and then slowly spread south and east across North America. Um, one of the results of that is, is what we call, um, at least in genetics, they call a founder effect. So as new individuals disperse out to a new area and start a new population, that population is descended from those relatively few individuals that started it. And so there's not a lot of genetic diversity. As moose spread south and east, that continued to happen over and over and over to the point where moose in most of North America and particularly in Eastern North America have very little genetic diversity. Um, to the point now where we actually can't use a lot of genetic techniques on moose because they all look like siblings. Um, so it creates some management challenges and also some, some challenges for um, moose themselves. Um, this is the range of moose. And if, if I go back a slide, um, if you look here, you can see the dark green area. That's that boreal forest that I was talking about before. Um, this is the range roughly of moose in North America currently. Um, as I mentioned, moose are strongly or very closely tied to that boreal forest. They're adapted to it. Um, and one of those key adaptations is that they are huge. Um, their size is very helpful, both in dealing with the cold um, of that northern climate. Larger animals hold body heat better, more efficiently. Um, their long legs and large body size also help them deal with deep snow and fend off predators. Um, a full grown adult moose can be six feet at the shoulder. Large bull moose can be more than that. Um, and it's truly one of the things, if you ever get the chance to be very close to a live standing moose, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but if you ever get the opportunity, the size of a moose is truly one of the most amazing things about them. It's, it's remarkable how big they are. Um, 
Again, an adult moose, at least in, in our part of the world, is typically going to weigh somewhere between 900 and 1200 pounds live weight. A large bull might get up to 1500 pounds uh, live weight. In Alaska and the Yukon, where they're, the subspecies of moose they have there is, is a little larger, um, the largest bulls there might push 2000 pounds live weight. Uh, for an animal that size, they need a lot of food. Uh, and so moose can consume up to 40 pounds of dry weight of food per day. Um, that in summer, you know, would, summer forage has a lot more water in it. Um, that could be up to 100 pounds of green forage every single day um, during the summer. So it takes a lot of food to sustain moose. Um, and one thing that's sort of unique about moose and, and an animal of that size is that they get the majority of that food from browse, um, meaning the, the leaves and buds and stems of woody plants, trees and shrubs. Um, most other large herbivores are either grazers, meaning they get most of their forage from, from grass and forbs, or generalist um, herbivores, more like deer and elk, which will kind of switch depending on what's most available. They'll browse at certain times of year, but they'll, they'll consume mostly grasses and forbs, particularly in the summer. Moose get the vast majority of their forage from browse year round. I mean, they're eating leaves mostly in the summer, but um, they're browsers year round. And that's sort of unique to a large animal. And, and again, tied to that, their, their um, adaptation to living in a forested Northern environment. Um, moving into the history, um, prior to European settlement, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Vermont was heavily forested, you know, more than 90, probably more than 95% forested. Um, moose were widespread and relatively abundant, um, based on what evidence we have. Um, they were widely utilized by Native American peoples, um, for food and fiber. Um, they were often hunted, um, chased down in deep snow on snowshoes. Uh, Native peoples actually developed the birch bark moose call, which is probably still the preferred moose call for hunters that hunters would use to attempt to call in a bull moose um, in the fall. And that was developed by Native American peoples. Um, during the, as European settlers arrived, during 1700s in Vermont and, and began clearing the land, settling the land. Um, they, of course, shot moose basically on site for food, right, for subsistence. Um, so, but there weren't very many people here and that, that probably didn't have a big impact, at least early on. But as that progressed, as more and more of the forests were cleared, and as those remaining moose were hunted with, with no restrictions, no laws protecting them, uh, moose were eventually extirpated from Vermont uh, at some point in the 1800s. Um, you know, Vermont, there's very little habitat for them left. Vermont was more than 80% cleared of forest. Um, and like I said, with no real protections, any remaining moose um, were shot by settlers uh, for food or if you were in Essex County where it was logging camps, they were shot by the loggers to, to feed the logging camps. Um, so moose were extirpated through a combination of habitat loss and, and unregulated hunting. Uh, in the 1900s, as those hill farms were abandoned, the forest began, began to come back. Um, so too did the moose, um, slowly at first, a few dispersers from um, Northern New Hampshire, Maine, places where they weren't extirpated. Um, and they were also protected at this time. Sometime, I don't know the exact year off the top of my head, but sometime in the late 1800s, um, our legislature, state legislature, banned or, or made it illegal to kill moose. Um, so they, they established a closed season, is what we would say. Um, and they did that at the same time they did it for a lot of species, deer included, um, and, and finally realized that they have to protect those species. So moose couldn't be legally harvested 
anymore in the 1900s, although there weren't any here. And our forests were beginning to come back. Um, and by about 1960, the department had an official, uh, quote unquote official, estimate of about 25 moose in Essex County. Um, so there was a population, but but barely. Um, what one thing that helped moose come back was the return of beavers. Um, beavers had also been extirpated from Vermont, um, over trapped basically, um, and they were reintroduced in the early 1900s, I believe. Again, I, I don't know exactly when there, but beavers were reintroduced and as they began um, to spread and, and increase across the state, um, that benefited moose, um, not the beaver themselves so much, but the habitat that they create. So beaver ponds, beaver wetlands are great moose habitat. Moose love water, they love wetlands. Um, it's no coincidence that if you Google moose pictures on the internet, you're gonna find a lot of pictures of moose in the water. I mean, the, the title slide of this presentation was moose in the water. Um, moose love water and particularly uh, marshy wetland areas. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, I mentioned earlier, the moose's diet is primarily browse and that's unusual for an animal of that size. And one thing that comes along with a primarily browse diet is that that browse is very low in certain minerals, um, primarily uh, or most notably sodium. So on their normal diet, moose become very deficient in certain minerals, again, primarily sodium. Aquatic vegetation is very high in those minerals, particularly sodium. And so moose are drawn to those foods and they, those are an important part of them being able to survive uh, in those Northern environments on a primarily browse diet. Um, and that's one of the reasons you'll see moose in the water feeding on aquatic vegetation. Uh, sort of an interesting note here is the, the moose's nose is sort of one of their more uh, characteristic features, uh, very unusual looking. Um, and no one knows exactly why it looks like it looks, but one of the going theories and, and one that makes the most sense to me, the, the shape of a moose's nose, moose is actually able to close its nostrils when it's underwater. That allows them to feed much more efficiently on uh, aquatic vegetation. They don't have to worry about sucking in water while they're doing it. Um, so that weird nose that they have actually is an evolutionary trait to allow them to feed more effectively on aquatic vegetation. Um, that salt, the need for salt also kind of gets moose in trouble. Um, so naturally in Northern forests, uh, mineral licks are, are rare, they're uncommon. Natural mineral licks are uncommon, but humans have created a lot of them alongside our roadways because we use de-icing salt in the winter, which runs off into little muddy areas beside the road and creates a mineral lick. And that is the primary reason that moose get hit on our roadways and hit and killed on our roadways. It's not unlike other species which are trying to cross the road and get hit. Moose are trying to basically be in the road licking it and then they get hit. Um, they're drawn to roadways for salt. And if we look at our roadkill, the data we have on roadkill moose in Vermont. So our department's been tracking this since 1980. And if we pile all that information together, look at the day of the year when moose are hit, we see a very obvious pattern, a very noticeable spike in May and June. Um, that is almost entirely related to the uh, period when moose have the greatest need for salt, for sodium. Um, they're coming out of winter, a long period when all they had to eat was browse, so they're already deficient in those minerals. And then that, that new spring and early summer vegetation that's very high water content makes that problem even worse. So they really need salt at that time of year, and there aren't aquatic plants available yet. 
So they're really attracted to roadside salt licks in the early, in the spring and early summer. And that's when most moose are hit on our roadways. Um, as aquatic vegetation becomes available in late summer, that, that declines. And then we see a little blip in the fall in September and October. Um, that is the rut, the breeding period for moose. Um, that's when they're most active. So that little blip is, the, is what happens just by moose being more active at that time of year. The much larger spike in the spring, again, is, is primarily related to their need for salt. Uh, so getting back to that history of moose and, and our progression here. Um, so moose were coming back. They were slowly, very slowly coming back. Um, but what really helped them out in the late 1900s um, was a spruce budworm outbreak or epidemic. Um, so spruce budworm is uh, really misnamed. It, it actually, it's a pest that primarily infests and kills balsam fir. Um, and it, it goes through cycles and periodically, every now and then, there'll be an outbreak of spruce budworm and it will, it will kill large numbers of balsam fir, uh, particularly in areas where it's a dominant part or a really common part of the forest. They, they can, of course, spread more easily there. Um, so this map on the, on the right here is the distribution of balsam fir in the Northeast in yellow. Was the areas that have balsam fir, and then the areas in orange are the areas where balsam fir is a is a, a more important part or a more common tree in the forest. Um, what happened in the late '70s and early '80s was a massive spruce budworm outbreak across pretty much all of eastern Canada and, and the Northeast, um, and it killed or threatened to kill vast swaths of of balsam fir across Northern New England and, and like I said, Eastern Canada. Um, the commercial timber companies that own that land in an effort to salvage what value they could from that resource um, conducted massive uh, salvage timber harvest operations in order to try to, try to recoup that. Um, you know, this is a period when in Northern Maine there were clear cuts that were thousands of acres in size. Um, huge, huge clear cuts, uh, even in northeastern Vermont, hundreds of acres. Um, it's actually what led to a lot of the clear cutting regulations. Um, but as that, you know, as those areas got logged, um, they of course regenerated. Um, and those that that young regenerating forest that came in after that provided a ton of food for the moose population. And the population responded accordingly. Um, we don't have reliable population estimates back then, but like I said, we've tracked roadkill moose since 1980. It's a good index of the population. You know, it, it follows the same trend, in other words, as the population does. Um, and clearly you can see here that the moose population was increasing dramatically through the 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, along with that increase and in the return of moose to the Northeast came the many values that moose provide um, from people just being able to see moose. I mean, it, certainly most Vermonters, um, at least in the 90s and early 2000s, most Vermonters had seen a moose. Um, that's not common anywhere, even, even in moose range. Um, moose are not a very visible species. Um, you know, whether you want to just see moose, the opportunity to see a moose, to know they're there, um, you can photograph moose, whether you want to shed hunt, which became a, a popular pastime for a lot of people, uh, finding moose antlers. Of course, you know, uh, moose drop their antlers every year and regrow them. Um, it's actually one of the fastest growing animal tissues in the world. Um, antlers on a large bull moose can grow, um, you know, five inches a week. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and they're, so a lot of people like to go uh, find them and collect them. Um, this is actually a picture of me from 20 years ago, one of the first antlers I found. And I used to do it a lot and I don't anymore. Um, life gets in the way, but also I don't like competing with all the other people that do it now. Um, but also, 
the return of moose hunting and being able to take advantage of the incredible amount of um, meat and food that that moose provide. Um, even our reduced hunt today provide literally provides tons of moose venison for Vermont families. Um, thousands of pounds of moose meat um, from a couple dozen moose. Um, it's a it's an incredible resource that we're now able to utilize. Um, and, and and you know people were really taking advantage of that and, and appreciating that through the 90s. Um, although by the late 90s, at least in the Northeast Kingdom, um, that was sort of too much of a good thing. Um, you know, the, the chart I showed you just barely was uh, the number of road killed moose. And uh, when moose are killed on the road, that's a significant safety hazard for people. Um, it's not like hitting a deer. Moose are, are large, large animals. And because of their height, they're often going to come through a windshield when they get hit um, by a car. The, you know, their legs get clipped out and they come through the windshield. So um, they're much more dangerous for people. Um, since 1980, 19 people have died in Vermont um, from collisions with moose. Uh, and by the early 2000s, it was pretty much about a, one person every year was dying from, from collisions with moose. Um, and you know, people were hitting hundreds, literally a couple hundred moose every year were being hit on Vermont roadways. Um, so that was a significant safety concern. On top of that, uh, moose were having a significant impact on their habitat. Uh, particularly in the Northeast Kingdom where, where moose densities were highest, um, but really uh, across much of Vermont. Um, this is a picture of moose bark stripping on mountain ash. Um, so they'll actually use their teeth and, and peel the bark off the trees. Uh, they really like mountain ash. It's one of their preferred uh, browse species. And this can uh, girdle and kill a lot of mountain ash trees. And mountain ash is a very important food source for a lot of wildlife, um, from bears to songbirds. Um, and, you know, the damage that moose were causing um, greatly reduced the number of mature mountain ash in many areas. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to find some, in some places a, a mature, um, large mountain ash now in, in parts of northeastern Vermont. Um, in addition to, to that specific case, you know, just general moose impacts in some areas were essentially preventing the forest from regenerating after, after logging. Um, this is an exclosure that was built uh, by the department in cooperation with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation in uh, the early 2000s in East Haven, uh, near the radar base, for those of you familiar with the area. Um, this area was cut about, uh, I think it was about 15 or 16 years prior to this photo. Uh, the exclosure was built nine years prior to this photo. So there's nine years of growth, essentially without moose inside that exclosure. And outside the trees, are, there's still trees there. They're just kept at about snow height in that area, which is you know three to four feet, about three feet there. Um, so it doesn't kill the trees, but they're not allowed to get above the depth where the snow or the height where the snow covers them. Um, so that has not only an impact on the, the forest, the health of the forest and, and the potential future forest, um, but for those landowners who are timber companies and they own that land to grow trees, uh, it has a significant economic impact on them as well. Um, and it's just another example of the sort of impact that moose can have, right? As I mentioned earlier, they eat a lot of food. They need a lot of food every single day. Um, that 40 pounds dry weight food that moose, that moose can consume in a day. Um, to put that in perspective, if you went out with hand pruners and, and nipped off little twigs and buds and filled a five gallon bucket, that would be maybe 10 pounds of dry weight food. So you'd have to fill four five gallon buckets with buds every single day. Um, I think you'd quickly see how you can deplete the amount of browse available in an area um, very quickly. And how moose, you know, at, at a higher density can have a pretty substantial impact 
on their habitat. And on top of damaging the habitat, um, you know, the moose are hurting themselves. They're, they're eating their food supply. And as a result, you start to see impacts to the health of moose. So under ideal conditions, uh, a moose can produce um, twins or adult, uh, a mature adult moose, um, meaning one that's you know three years old or older, would produce twins about half of the time. Or another way to put that would be about in any given year, about half of your mature adults would can produce twins. Um, younger animals are most likely going to have a single calf if they have one at all. As um, the population becomes less healthy, as there's less food available for each moose, um, those cows are more likely going to just have produce a single calf each year. And so we can look at, at uh, things like reproductive rate or in the moose world, um, it's more commonly they look at twinning rate specifically, um, depending on how they're able to to measure and sample for that. Um, but basically you're looking at the reproductive rate, how many calves are produced per cow. And, and what we were seeing, what the department was seeing, this is before my time, but what the department was seeing in the, from the nineties to the early two thousands was a pretty sharp decline in the reproductive rate for moose. Um, so this is ovulation rate. This is the best measure we have. We can't actually, it's very difficult to go out there and actually see newborn calf moose. Um, you know, moose live in dense forested areas and they don't want to be seen at that time of year. Um, so our best way to measure this is actually to take the ovaries from cow moose that are harvested and we can section them and we can see how many eggs were released and therefore how many calves that cow would have produced the following spring. Um, and so it actually gives us a really good measure of reproductive rate. Um, and certainly there's noise here, but you know, if you look at that trend line, and this is significant, um, that declined in, in 12 years from about 1.5, meaning about half of your cows producing twins, your mature cows, to almost one, so just above one. So twins became very rare, basically is what happened. Um, and, and at the same time, we saw declines in, in other health measures like body weights, um, antler size in bulls. Um, the moose were becoming less healthy because their habitat was um, being heavily impacted. Um, and so it was obvious that something needed to be done um, to improve the health of moose and their habitat. Now, when moose hunting started in Vermont, um, in 1993, there were, there were 30 moose hunting permits issued. Um, all of those in uh, Wildlife Management Unit E, which is basically Essex County. Um, and as time went on, the moose population kept increasing and the number of permits was increased along with it. Um, but obviously it didn't have an impact, right? The population was still going up very, very sharply um, despite increasing numbers of permits. And of course, these are also we're also expanding the area where moose hunting was allowed. So it, it was expanding to other parts of the state at the same time. So while the number of permits was going up, the number in a given area wasn't necessarily increasing all that much. Um, so it became obvious that something needed to be done and, and the department needed to reduce the moose, the number of moose, the density of moose on the landscape, especially in the Northeast Kingdom where the density was highest and where they were having the greatest impact. And so for a period of, of a few years, um, five or six or seven years, depending on which where what you wanna use as a threshold there, um, the department issued very high numbers of moose hunting permits. Um, most of those were in the Northeast Kingdom and a large number of those were for cow moose only, or antlerless moose only. Um, and it, in a deliberate effort to reduce the moose population to a more sustainable density and, and hopefully improve the health of the moose herd. Um, and that worked, it worked quite well. Um, so this is again, that roadkill um, information in orange. And then the green line here is our uh, 
statewide moose population estimate, which like I said, we have that since about 2000. Uh, we don't have that information prior, but they track each other quite well. So just to show you what happened here, um, you know, the population came down quite quickly until about 2010 or 11, when that was when permit numbers were reduced to about 400 permits. Um, and at the time, the department believed that that should be a sustainable number of permits going forward, um, even based on the less than ideal reproductive rates that we were seeing from our cows. The population should have been able to sustain about 400 permits or a harvest of two to 300 moose every year, um, you know, going forward and that the population should have remained stable with that harvest if reproductive rates were that high and if survival was what we, we survival rates were as good as, as we thought they were. Um, but that didn't happen. The population, despite reducing the number of permits, the population continued to decline, albeit a little slower. It continued to decline for several years. Um, and as a result, or in response, the department continued to reduce permit numbers year over year and in 2015 moved to um, primarily bull only permits so to reduce the harvest of cow moose in order to protect them and try to stabilize the population and ultimately it ended up where we issued no moose hunting permits in 2019 um, that was more of a really that was about changing some some of our regulations which had been put in place when there were hundreds of permits being issued and they created some some weird scenarios when we were trying to issue you know 20 or fewer permits um so it's not that we didn't think we should be hunting moose at that time it's that we had some regulations that needed to be changed um to be fair when we were issuing issuing few permits um but regardless the point is we greatly reduced the number of of uh, moose hunting permits in order to try to get the population to stabilize. Um, now, looking back now with the data we have today, um, this is only in Wildlife Management Unit E. As I said before, it's where most of our moose live. It's our highest moose density. It's where we have the best data on our moose population. But looking at, back at this now with the data that we have, it actually looks like over the past 10 years, our population, at least in this part of the state, has been relatively stable. Um, it didn't look like that four years ago, but you know, again, with, with more data, um, we can now say, well, okay, it's been relatively stable for 10 years, but that's with, at least recently, very minimal, almost no, very minimal moose harvest and basically no cow moose harvest. And the population still hasn't really increased. And this in our area with the best moose habitat. Um, more importantly, aside from the population not increasing, health never improved. Um, ovulation rates continued to decline. And, and you know, we, we lose data in recent years because we stopped harvesting cow moose. So we can't continue this data set. Um, but even if we look at things like body weight um, or antler size, um, They've, they've stayed at low levels. We have not seen a recovery in moose health, even though the habitat has improved. Um, browsing impacts are, are much less than they were in the early 2000s. Um, the current landowner, uh, Weyerhaeuser in the Northeast Kingdom is doing a lot of timber harvesting. There's a lot of browse for moose currently, um, but their health is still poor. Uh, so the question becomes, why? Why haven't we seen a recovery in our moose population? And there are three primary reasons. Uh, winter tick, brainworm, and habitat are really changes in moose habitat. Uh, and I'll touch on all three of these because um, they're, all, they're all important. Um, the most important one is winter tick. Uh, before I get into that, though, I want to provide some perspective on our moose population, specifically our moose densities here in the Northeast and in Vermont, uh, relative to the rest of North America. Um, so this is a map of um, from a paper published a few years ago. Um, the data 
So this is from each state in each Canadian province um, provided their estimates of moose density for each of their management units. So that's what each of these little polygons is, um, is one of their management units. In Vermont, we call them wildlife management units, but other places call them different things. Um, so they provided these densities. So, so this shows the densities of moose across North America. Um, I think the interesting thing to point out here is the kind of band of higher moose density that extends across the continent. Um, that is the area where you're, for, you're far enough south that the habitat is reasonably productive. Um, you know, you're not getting up into the sort of tundra, black spruce, really unproductive northern forest. You're far enough south to where you have reasonably productive habitat. But you're not so far south that you're dealing with um, the, the things that affect animals on the southern edge of their range, which is primarily competition with other species, parasites, disease. Um, so you're not getting into that yet, but you have still reasonably productive habitat. If we zoom in on that area or focus on that area, um, so this is just recolored, you know, focused on the highest density uh, units across the continent. The areas shown in red on this map are the areas where moose density is greater than one moose per square mile. Um, and this comes from 2010, so it's a little outdated, um, but it, it, it's pretty close. Not much has changed really in that time. Um, so just to point this out, Northeastern Vermont, WMUE, Northern New Hampshire, and, and most of Maine, New Brunswick, um, southern Quebec, Gas Bay Peninsula. That area, one large blob of red, is one of the highest density moose populations in North America. It's one of the very few places where densities exceed one per square mile. Um, and in much of that area, mainly northern Maine, New Brunswick, and Quebec, um, densities are four to eight moose per square mile. Those are densities that are not seen anywhere else in the world, except on Newfoundland and a few areas in Scandinavia. Um, across most of moose range, they exist at very low densities. Um, you know, one per square mile doesn't sound like much, but they're big animals and they need a lot of food and a lot of space to find that food. Um, so they naturally exist at low densities. Um, we've been spoiled in the Northeast and we kind of need to set some realistic expectations of what we should have. Zooming in on, on New England, um, this is a map uh, from a publication by Pierman Gilman and, and colleagues from UVM uh, a couple of years ago. It's the probability of moose occurrence. So it's not an estimate of moose habitat quality or the density of moose. It's just how likely is there to be a moose in that area? Um, red being more likely, blue being less likely. And a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, most importantly is the, the core range is highlighted. But also if you look at Vermont relative to, to New Hampshire or Maine, you see that our best moose habitat or the, the areas most likely to have moose are sort of broken up. There's a bunch of little islands, poorly connected. Um, it's not the big solid red blob of the core area that we see. Um, and that, I'll, I'll touch more on that later. That's, that's a kind of an important thing for our moose population here in Vermont. But this core area, the circled in, in red here, that's the area of, of New England that has by far the highest moose densities. The vast majority of moose in New England live in that area. There are moose in the rest of New England, um, you know, lower and lower densities, fewer and fewer as you go south. Uh, but that core area is really where most moose in New England live. Um, and there are a few reasons why it's, it's better moose habitat. Um, first, it has a colder climate, right? Moose are in, we're at the Southern edge of moose range. Um, they're naturally gonna gravitate to the areas with the coldest climate. Um, they're adapted to that. They do better in those areas. Um, they, they, they less competition, but also the forest types that they prefer. Um, related to this is the abundance of deer. Um, so deer compete with moose to some extent. They eat the same foods at certain times of the year. 
But more importantly, deer carry brainworm. And I'll touch on that more in a bit. Um, and, and that actually allows deer to win the competition with moose um, ultimately. So moose do best in areas with lower deer numbers. And, and this map is actually deer harvest from 2016. Each dot is a, is a harvested deer, um, but it really shows the areas of New England that have a lot of deer and those areas that have very few deer. And the mostly white areas on the map are areas where we have the most moose, not coincidentally. Um, but most importantly, the primary reason that this area supports much higher numbers of moose is that it is almost entirely industrial or commercial timberland. Um, and those landowners intensively manage that land for timber production. They log it heavily. Um, as a result, there is an abundance of early successional or young forest habitat, which provides a lot of food for moose. And as we've been over many times now, moose need a lot of food. And that is why these areas support much higher moose densities than the rest of New England. And that's critical when we start talking about winter tick. So the winter tick is one of 14 species of tick that are found in Vermont. Uh, many, many people are not aware that there are that many species of tick in Vermont. Uh, humans are only like, likely to come into contact with two species, and most people only know about two species, uh, those being the black-legged tick or deer tick and the dog tick. Um, there are several other species. Most of them specialize on, on certain animals, and, and I don't know that they would bite a human, but they're certainly very unlikely to bite a human, even if given the chance. Um, winter ticks kind of fall into that category. Um, winter ticks have are often called a moose tick because of their association with moose. Um, unlike the ticks people are most familiar with, deer ticks and dog ticks, winter ticks are native to Vermont. They've been here as, as long as we've been able to document them. As long as we've been monitoring moose, um, we've documented winter ticks on moose. Uh, we even documented winter ticks killing moose in the early 90s. Um, so they are not new uh, to Vermont or to the moose world, um, but the current problems we have with them are sort of a new thing. Um, so one thing that makes the winter tick unique in the tick world um, and what makes them so much of a problem for moose is their life cycle. Uh, so most ticks are what we would call a three host tick. So in each of their three life stages, larva, nymph, and adult, they'll feed on a different host. So they'll get on a host, they'll take a blood meal, they'll drop off and molt. They'll get on a different host in the next life stage for a couple of days, take a blood meal, drop off and molt, and do that again for an adult before dropping off and laying eggs. That's also why those ticks spread diseases because they're able to pick it up from one host and transfer it to another host. Winter tick is of Vermont's, the ticks in Vermont, the only one that is a, a one host tick. So they complete their entire life cycle on the same individual animal. They get on an animal in the fall, they spend the entire winter on that animal, molting several times, and then drop off in the spring to lay eggs. And that's, that's, why, that's where the name winter tick comes from. Um, at the timing of all of this is part of the problem for moose. So in the fall, when those ticks are questing, so when they're out on vegetation looking for a host to get on, um, the peak of that questing period coincides with the moose rut, the breeding period for moose. So when, as I showed you earlier, when moose are most active, um, they're moving around a lot more, which allows them to pick up more ticks. Um, and then of course that drop off period in the spring, um, is the end of winter. It's a terrible time. Moose are already in really poor shape. And that's when those ticks are taking their biggest blood meal. Um, and that allows them um, to kill some moose, but severely debilitate the ones they don't kill. Um, the other main reason why they, these are such a problem for moose and not really for other species is that moose are terrible groomers. 
Um, they did not evolve with external parasites. So, you know, species like deer evolved with ticks, they, they're behavioral groomers. So they just, they groom themselves regularly out of habit, whether there's actually something there to groom off or not, they just do it regularly. Uh, moose do not. They're um, stimulus groomers. There's various terms for it, but basically moose will only groom themselves when they have an itch and they're big animals. It takes a lot to make a moose itch. Um, so by the time they actually feel a need to groom themselves, it's too late and they've accumulated tens of thousands of ticks and those ticks are already firmly attached in mid to late winter. Um, so the important consideration here is that um, winter ticks are only a problem for moose. They only cause significant population impacts to moose where moose densities are high. Um, and, and the reason for that, I mean, like I said, they're, they're very dependent on moose. They can't really, they don't do well. The winter tick does not do well on other host species. Most of them get groomed off. If they happen to get on a deer, they're not gonna make it all the way through the winter without that deer grooming them off. And of course, if they fall off in the winter, they're gonna die. So they're really tied to moose for their success. Um, and so the density of moose has a significant impact on how many winter ticks are out there on the landscape. And just to kind of illustrate that, if you have a high density of moose, those questing larvae that are out there in the fall are much more likely to be picked up. Now, they can't, they can't move and seek out a moose. They're, they're pretty much stuck on uh, the vegetation wherever the, the female laid the eggs in the spring. The, the larvae are born and they crawl up the nearest vegetation and wait for a moose. So they can't seek out a moose. They're dependent on a moose coming by. If there are more moose, there's a much greater chance that one is gonna walk by and pick them up. And of course, if there are more moose all carrying the same number of large number of ticks, um, they're going to drop off a large number of female ticks in the spring to lay eggs and start that cycle all over again. On the other hand, if there are fewer moose, even if you start with the same number of, of questing larvae, larval ticks in the fall, there's a much less of a chance that those ticks are gonna get picked up by a moose. There's just fewer moose out there, so they're just not gonna wander by as many ticks. Those moose, even if they carry the same number of ticks, each moose carries the same number of ticks, there are fewer moose. So collectively, they're going to drop off fewer female ticks in the spring. And if you played this out another year, the following fall, there would be fewer questing larval ticks. So the density of moose is the primary driver of the abundance of winter ticks. And that brings us back to this core moose range. This is the only area in New England where winter ticks are having a significant impact on the moose population. You can find winter ticks on every moose in New England, no matter where they are, all the way down into Massachusetts, their moose have winter ticks on them, um, but they don't have enough winter ticks to cause a problem, right? A moose, an adult moose can probably carry a couple thousand winter ticks and it won't really bother them. It's, you know, it's a small parasite and it's a large animal. Um, a couple thousand is a lot of ticks, but it's not enough to actually significantly impact that animal. When they start carrying tens of thousands of ticks, it causes problems. And we've documented, I think our high in Vermont was over 40,000 uh, ticks on a calf moose, uh, 11 month old calf moose. Uh, in New Hampshire, they documented one of their radio card calves with over 90,000 ticks on it. Um, those are the numbers we don't want to see anymore. Um, you know, we can deal with ticks on moose. That's not a problem. We can't deal with tens of thousands of ticks on moose. Anyway, this area is the only place with enough moose to have tick problems. Remember, it's also the coldest part of New England. So although climate change is a factor, shorter winters help the ticks. This is not a climate change issue. 
This is a too many moose issue. Um, the fix for it is fewer moose. The reason this has gotten so much press, even though it doesn't affect moose across most of New England, is because, the, as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of our moose live in that core area. So although it's not where most people live, reducing the moose, number of moose in that core area reduces, greatly reduces the overall number of moose in New England. Um, to kind of focus that on Vermont here, uh, this map on the right is our populate, moose population estimates. So each dot represents an estimated moose in that wildlife management unit. And all I'm trying to emphasize here is just how much higher the density of moose is in wildlife management unit E than the rest of the state. Um, it's not even close. And that, that wildlife management unit E up in the northeast corner of the state, that's the only place where we have uh, major issues with winter ticks. It's the only place we're currently hunting moose. Um, and, and part of that hunt is, is to try to reduce the population there and only there um, to address winter ticks. And I, I use this map on the left to kind of get that point across to people. We're only managing moose in, in WMUE. The rest of the state, we are not currently hunting moose. There are other issues affecting our moose population there um, that are not related to winter tick or not primarily at least winter tick. And that brings us to our other two factors. Um, brainworm, which kills a fair number of moose um, every year. Uh, brainworm is a parasite carried by white-tailed deer. Uh, it has a fascinating life cycle, um, but it's, it's very common in deer. It, um, some estimates have been, you know, 70 to 90% of deer might carry brainworm. Um, but anyway, this is a, this is a parasitic uh, worm, round worm, that lives in the meninges, so the, the lining around the brain of, of white-tailed deer. Um, it, the life cycle is that it you know, gets into the deer's uh, bloodstream, lungs, it's coughed up, swallowed, comes out, the larvae at least, come out in deer feces. That uh, brainworm larvae then needs to be picked up by a gastropod, so a snail or a slug that crawls over those deer feces. And then that gastropod needs to be inadvertently eaten by a deer to start that cycle all over again. Um, and deer regularly eat, you know, small snails and slugs while they're feeding on leaves and vegetation. Um, that, that's more common than you probably think, um, but it's still quite a remarkable life cycle. How that evolves is beyond me. Um, but the way this bothers moose is if a moose happens to eat that infected snail or slug, the moose did not evolve with the brain worm. And, and so the, the chemical signals that the worm would normally follow in the deer are not there. And the worm ends up taking, you know, different routes. They often end up in the spinal cord or in the brain itself. Um, and as you can probably imagine, a worm burrowing holes through your brain or spinal cord is not uh, particularly good for you. Um, and it often results in moose exhibiting uh, abnormal behavior, uh, neurologic disease, essentially. Um, they often waste if they survive long enough. They'll be very thin, um, stumble around, walk in circles is a common symptom. But ultimately, once you see a moose exhibiting those symptoms, it is going to die. Um, we don't know if moose can become infected with brainworm and never develop symptoms. Um, we just, we, we don't know enough about the the parasite at this point. Um, but the, it, the reason this is an issue <clears throat> is because, you know, research has shown that in areas with higher deer densities, there is, of course, a greater abundance of brainworm on the landscape. Moose are more likely to pick it up. And so in areas, you know, there's debate about where exactly the threshold is, and, and it, it, there's probably a lot of factors that play into it. But roughly speaking, if you see deer densities greater than 10 deer per square mile or so, um, you may see declines in your moose population related to brainworm. At lower deer densities, you don't usually see that. In most of Vermont, outside of 
Essex County, Wildlife Management Unit E, and maybe some high elevation areas, we have more than 10 deer per square mile. Um, so, so this is an important consideration, one that we're trying to figure out a little more about and understand more about, including the gastropod part of it, um, but definitely is, has a known impact on our moose population um, in most of Vermont. But probably the more important factor outside of the commercial timberlands of, of the Northeast Kingdom is the lack of young forest habitat in most of Vermont. So throughout the at least central and southern Vermont, our forests are getting older. Um, there's less and less of that young forest habitat that pro provides that food for moose. And so, you know, we just, we can't, our forests cannot support very many moose anymore. And as a result, um, you know, we, we're seeing declines in the population. So just to um, kind of put some data behind that, um, this is the decline in young forest habitat based on US Forest Service FIA, forest inventory analysis data. Um, the green lines being Vermont and then Northern and Southern Vermont, there's more young forest in Northern Vermont. Again, most of that is in the Northeast Kingdom in those commercial timberlands. Um, in Southern Vermont, we're now, I mean, we're basically, we don't have, it doesn't even register. We have so little young forest. And in most of the state, we're below what researchers believe was here prior to European settlement, the amount of young forest. Um, so, I mean, we just really don't have good quality, even decent, even moderate quality moose habitat in most of Vermont anymore. And so we shouldn't expect very high moose densities. Um, and then the map here on the right is, is sort of related data. Um, it's actually the number of saplings. So it's tree size, not, not age. Um, and saplings can certainly be more than 20 years old, but does do a pretty good idea of showing you the parts of New England that have more, that have younger forests uh, or more young forest habitat. And, and not coincidentally, it's Northeastern Vermont, Northern New Hampshire, and most of Maine, the areas where we have more moose. Um, you know, that is, we know that's a driver of, of moose populations. And, and that really is why we just aren't ever going to see, at least not anytime soon, going to see um, any more moose than we, than we currently have probably in, in most of Vermont, outside of the Northeast Kingdom. So if you're trying to manage for moose in Vermont, if you want to ensure a good future for moose in Vermont, we need more young forest habitat. Um, it benefits moose and, and a whole slew of other species. Uh, I'm not suggesting we should try to look like Northern Maine. I don't think that's a, a reasonable goal, but it's not an either or. We can have old forest and young forests. Um, we just need a more diverse and complex forest than we currently have. The, the middle age forest with nothing growing in the understory, um, it's very unproductive habitat. It might as well be a desert for most. Um, so we need to make our forest more complex um, to help our moose and, and many, many, many other species. And the, the other thing that I think is, is very important for moose in particular, um, again, a wide range of species, but, but speaking specifically about moose here, is maintaining a co connected landscape. Um, so I showed you that that map earlier, which where Vermont had a lot of kind of islands of decent moose habitat or good potential moose habitat. Um, as our climate continues to warm, those are going to become more and more of islands for moose. And so, you know, moose need a lot of room to roam. They're big animals and they can disperse really long distances, but they need to have good habitat in between. Um, they're forest animals, so we need to maintain connected uh, forest so that they can get from one island to the next. And moose can disperse from north, northeastern Vermont to the Green Mountains um, or to the Adirondacks or from the northern greens to the southern greens or from Maine to Vermont. Um, and, and having that regional connectivity moving forward is going to be very important for moose. Um, and so, you know, our department has worked on programs like Vermont Conservation Design to try to identify those key forest blocks, 
um, and connectivity areas and, and just how do we, what areas do we need to protect to maintain a functional landscape in the future? Um, and that'll be particularly important for moose. Um, you know, the warm weather isn't gonna be an issue for them so much as the loss of young forests and the fragmentation of our forests. Um, so really trying to maintain that connected landscape. And I'll close on, um, you know, moose are at the southern edge of their range in Vermont. Um, so they're certainly not going to be, they're going to lose with climate change. But that said, if we can maintain good habitat here, um, we can have moose for the foreseeable future. And I, I fully expect that to be the case. Um, but it's going to take, uh, it's going to be a big effort and it's going to take uh, a lot of work. Uh, so with that, um, I will open it up to questions. Great, Nick. Thanks. That was great. Um, you know, I had no idea about the, the lack of genetic diversity in our moose population. That was really interesting. I learned so much today. Um, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box. Um, I have a quick one. You know, you talked a lot about management unit um, E. Are the management units for moose the same um, distribute or the same boundaries as the management units for deer? Yeah, we use the same management units for um, for all of our big game species, but it really is only moose and deer where we actually manage differently in each one. Well, that's not true. We do with turkeys as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Let's see. No one's come on, people. Let's see something in the chat box. I'm sure you have questions or at least something you want to comment on. <laughs> I thought it was great. I was thinking about that five gallon bucket exercise. What a great exercise for kids at um, conservation camp. To yeah, really it's I mean, it's like something it. that's it's often used for deer because 10, 10 pounds is roughly what a deer would eat dry weight in a day. So fill a five gallon bucket is what you need to feed a deer. Um, it's quite exaggerated for most, though. Yeah, that, that to me was also another, you know, a great visual. So I really appreciate that. And a lot of your, your uh, presentation gave a lot of great visuals on the aspects of, of moose management. So I really appreciated that. Thanks. Uh, so Gresham wants to know if you have a good estimate now at this point, how many moose there are in Vermont? Our current estimate statewide is, is, uh, 23 or 2400 moose so a little over 2000 moose statewide um, and again about it, it's literally about half so about 1200 of those are in wildlife management unit e so so if you want to see a moose head up to the northeast corner yep. of the state <laughs> well that's great well i'm not really seeing any questions and we're at 7:30. So I'm happy to let Nick go unless anybody has a pressing question. Oh, we did pop another one in there. Um, oh, that's a great question. You talked a lot about the need for young forests for generating food for moose. So how large of a clear cut in Vermont would benefit moose? Uh, that, that is a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that's very specific to, to a given area. Um, An individual moose, so I, I mean, we just did a timber harvest on our property last fall, and it's a bunch of small little patch cuts, um, you know, half acre to up to maybe two acres. Um, but I'm thinking like if we had a moose that lived on our property, it would probably eat everything that grew back. Um, so I think you have to think about it, not so much as you trying to sustain a moose alone on your property, because that would probably require a very large amount of young forest habitat. Um, you have to think about it in a larger context and where you fit in the landscape. Um, you know, if, if all the property around you lacks young forest, then, then the more you can make, the better. Um, but if, you know, if you live in the Northeast Kingdom and there's a lot around you, you probably don't need to make a whole lot. Yeah, we often in the coverage training advise people, um, and not just for moose, but for wildlife in general, is take that bird's eye view. If you've never Googled your property, you should totally do that um, and switch it to the, um, what's the view called? But basically it's the 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 aerial view. So you can yeah, see the forest. Lighting. 
satellite imagery, thank you. Um, and, and really take a look at what your property has to offer and what it is you wanna to draw to your property because that's gonna influence the kind of management that, that you choose. So that, that was a great question. Um, we'll take one more question. Uh, Daniel wants to know, do warmer winters affect that tick population, the winter tick? I, that is a great question. Um, warmer winters don't, um, don't necessarily make a difference. Um, the, the biggest thing for winter ticks is the length of the winter. Um, so that the first snowfall or the first, the first snowfall that lingers for a day or two um, in the fall ends that questing period, you know, when the ticks are getting on the move. So if, if it doesn't snow until mid to late November or December, then ticks have a long time to get on moose. And so moose accumulate a whole lot more ticks. Um, on the other side, in the spring, when the ticks are dropping off, if they drop on snow, their chance of survival is very low, um, mostly because they get eaten by birds. Um, and if they drop on the leaf litter, they're gonna survive and lay eggs. So it's if we have longer winters, the ticks aren't going to do as well. Um, if we have short winters, uh, that that benefits them. So they are benefiting from climate change, which is giving us shorter winters. Um, but again, it, it all comes down to the number of moose that they have to find. We have a final great question to end on. If someone wanted to see moose, where's the best, least disrupted place to see them? And are there any special viewing areas that have been created to do so? So the best place to see a moose if you wanna see it from your vehicle without hiking to the top of a mountain, um, is uh, on Route 105 between Island Pond and Bloomfield. Um, the state has, uh, actually has a viewing tower um, there. Um, I don't know that the tower is exactly in the best spot, but there's a long stretch um, of Salt Lake area along, along Route 105. Um, it's actually in the town of Brunswick, but in any way, it's, it's halfway between Island Pond and Bloomfield. Um, and if you're there in the early morning, and I mean like sunrise, you have a very good chance of seeing a moose. If you show up in the middle of the day, you will not see a moose. But if you're there in the morning, um, you have a very good chance. Well, great. Well, I think it's time to wrap things up. Nick, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this presentation. Hope everybody on board did as well. Vermont Coverts is really pleased to be able to host these kinds of presentations. Uh, we're glad that you're able to, to join us. And if you have any ideas for future uh, presentations, the topics that you're interested in hearing about, please let us know. Also, if you haven't signed up for our e-news, you can do so online at our website. And I will put a pitch in for the Vermont Habitat stamp. Uh, it's uh, a stamp that the department has that helps with the purchase of uh, habitat for wildlife. So it's, if you don't have one of those and you wanna support uh, the purchase of wildlife habitat, you can get a habitat stamp. And of course, always co contribute to Vermont Coverage. Thank you all and have a great night.